بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله Welcome, uh, thank you for being here I know mashallah with the current weather situation a lot of people aren't really coming out and I totally understand I have friends who have asthma or their kids have other respiratory issues, so it's very difficult to be out, but um, thank you for being here. Um, alhamdulillah, may Allah provide uh, relief to all who are suffering. I, I missed, unfortunately, the prayer, but inshallah, may Allah accept that prayer, and hopefully we'll see some rain in the next few days, inshallah, and some relief. Um, for those who have not attended this before, this is the third workshop that we've done. Just to, so I get an idea, how many of you have actually maybe watched uh, the, the other two that, that was posted or were here? Okay, alhamdulillah, great. So, um, you know, before we jump into this, because this is um, the third session, I wanted to do a review of the uh, previous session, just to kind of bring everybody up to speed. So I'm going to go over some of those uh, slides quickly, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and into, into the discussion, inshallah, for today. So last time we were here, we talked about, um, well, here's the outline. Uh, closer, okay, sure. All right, I'll, I'll actually sit a little closer, inshallah. So here's the outline, but uh, we'll just go ahead and get into it. So we first talked about spiritual principles and practices that for every Muslim home, that we should all be doing our best to implement in our homes. Um, and so we said right away from you know the, the very first one here is to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wholeheartedly and practice daily gratitude to Him. So we differentiated between half-hearted love and wholehearted love. What does that mean? You know, if you are, for example, um, you know, uh, there's many, mashallah, in our, in our community, many people who have obvious reverence for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They will um, put it, you know, on the highest bookshelves. They might even wrap it in, in really beautiful cloth. Um, and that's, that's a great sign of reverence and, and adab uh, for, for, to Allah and for his book. However, if you're not reading from the book or acting from the book, then there is some you know, disconnect there, right? You might be showing the love in one case, but then you're not following through. So this would be a good example of half-hearted, okay, love of Allah. And a lot of times in our homes, we might not be aware of, of how we, uh, we don't, we're not fully sincere sometimes in the way that we show love. Um, but we would never deny our love, right? If someone asked us, of course, alhamdulillah, we love Allah, we, we believe in Allah, we believe in His messengers, we believe in His book, in His book. but when it comes to action and follow through, that is where the evidence of true love is, right? So wholehearted love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really taking seriously the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's expectations are of us and really being obedient, right? Listening with full attention and, and, and presence. And so that obviously you know, when it comes to action, the very first thing that we're going to be asked about are our prayers. So making sure that in our homes we establish uh, very clear rules about praying all five prayers on time and doing our best, inshallah, to do those prayers together as a family. Um, and I obviously, with you know, with, as time permits, because when you're going to, uh, during the day hours, if you're working or your kids are in school, that's not possible. However, the other prayers that are able, you are able to do together as a family, the evening prayers, the early morning prayer before you go to school, and then obviously on the weekends, those are all opportunities that you should try to create again this uh, sort of just, it's what you do in your home. You pray together as a family and making and being very seriously committed to that practice. Um, and so that's, you know, like, again, we're, we're talking about how to, how to establish love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet said of in our homes, this is one great way to do that. Also love and re of recitation of the Qur'an. So if you, um, you know, we talked about this as well, it's very important to take our uh, relationship with the Qur'an seriously. 
So a lot of parents are good about that for their children. You know, they may put them in Sunday school or have a private tutor or use an online program to get their kids to have a connection with Allah, but they might neglect that for themselves. They may not have ever taken a class, for example, on Tajweed or, um, you know, ever studied, you know, anything, you know, even Tafsir or anything that really sort of uh, you know, broadens their relationship with the Book of Allah. They may have never committed to those studies. And so that is obviously going to impact, this is again another example of, of the wholehearted versus the half-hearted. If you yourself are not doing these things, and you've, if you recognize that you need to improve your relationship with the Qur'an, do it. Start with yourself. Look for teachers. And in this day and age, there's really no excuse. We have, mashallah, especially here in this community in the Bay Area, we are very, very blessed with uh, ample uh, opportunities, ample uh, supply of teachers who are qualified to teach male and female, uh, some privately, some in different massages or uh, institutions nearby, but also online. I mean, there's now so many different resources. So we have to, though, take it seriously and realize it is a farbain to know how to read the Book of Allah. So when you recognize that, then not, you don't just look at it for your children and then pressure them all the time, because parents will be very good at policing how much Qur'an their kids have memorized, if they know how to read Arabic. They're very good at that, but again, it starts with you. How are you? What's your relationship like with the Qur'an? So making sure that love of, of the Qur'an is there, and also, more specifically, I wrote here, love of recitation of the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is beautiful. And uh, it's beautiful in meaning, it's beautiful in, in everything, in sound. That's why we have this beautiful art of, of tajweed, of learning how to recite. So it's not just this book that we read from, but we actually engage in a very spiritual way when we recite. And so if you create that in your home, then you can, inshallah, practice either reciting together, but especially for young children, I mean, this is very important that we, uh, we, we say their du'as over them, you know? So instead of just reading a bedtime story at night, for example, that you spend a good 10, 15 minutes reading all of the protective surahs and du'as over them before they sleep, and actually doing it in a beautiful voice. And then when you connect it back to the five daily prayers, that's also a really beautiful way to make the prayer beautiful. Instead of it a rushed process, or a very dry process where it's just like, you know, everybody just kind of stands there, you know, does their mechanical actions. When you have a beautiful recitation, if you, inshallah, are working on it, or your children, everybody's working on it, then it makes the prayer really enjoyable. And so when you're done, everybody feels, you know, just like, wow, that was just a really nice experience. Instead of, again, it just being, you know, mechanical and outward. We, we can br bring all that beauty out through connecting it with the uh, recitation of the Qur'an. So these kind of can work together, these two things. And then obviously the daily dhikr that we do is very important. If, if we're not doing reminders on a daily basis, especially protective du'as, then we're just kind of setting ourselves up for problems because the dunya is a very difficult place. You know, we've talked about this. It's a place of trial, of tribulation, of sickness, of worry, of stress, of debt, of just anxiety. There's so many things that are just part and parcel of this dunya, of being here alive in this world. Therefore, we have to take whatever means we can to protect ourselves, to protect our spiritual hearts from being affected by these things, right? It's like medicine for the soul. And those are daily awrad because they actually have protective du'as, right? When you actually have a wird, or a, it's a, which, is, which is a litany of prayers, all from the sunnah the Prophet that you're committed to on a daily basis, you are seeking protection from Allah subhanahu wa from all the dangers and the, 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 just the things that you might not even think about. But this should be a practice for your family. It's not just something, I think we've, we've gotten to a place where, where spirituality is something very, very deep and personal, which it should be. But then as parents, we have to also create 
you know, these things for our children, so that habits, so that they can carry them on. So we have to actually do things with the family as well. You can't just isolate yourself uh, and, and you know, do things only when you're by yourself, you know. If you're waking up, inshallah, for the hajjad, or when you add Isha, that's when you kind of just settle in and you read Quran. And it's just this deep personal thing. Good for you. We should all do that, inshallah, in our time. But if you're not doing it with your family, and you want your children, which we all do, we want our children to be, uh, inshallah, believers. We want them to go out into the world, be pr productive and successful people. We can't expect them to succeed if we're not doing the work while they're young to plant those seeds for them, right? That's what this is about. So you actually have to be willing to do things as a family and to re recognize the importance of, of making spiritual practice a family thing. It's not just an individual thing, you know. And individually, mashallah, if you want to do things outside just for yourself, nobody's saying not to do that. But you shouldn't do it like it shouldn't be one or the other. Um, they, sh you know, try to do both. You know, really make it. Uh, and this is where it's so important that both husband and wife are on the same page about this. You know, and I, and I, I've definitely dealt with couples where they, they're, uh, you know, the, the spouses are sort of spiritually on two different paths. And uh, mashallah, you know, we have to come together for the common good of the children. So even if maybe you are not fully, uh, you know, uh, practicing maybe where you should be, it's okay to still try to create um, that culture for your family and not hold yourself like, oh, you know, well, I'm not doing it. Why should I say it to them? No, remind them. It's better that you, it comes from you because maybe by you reminding them repeatedly, let's say, for example, if you're missing some of your prayers, but yet you're, you're, you still realize the, the amana of, 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 of your, you know, your duty as a parent and you want to remind your children to pray, you shouldn't stop yourself and say, well, I'm not praying five times a day. Why am I going to tell them to pray five times a day? This is waswasa from shaitan. Okay, don't do that because by remind, by being the, in that position and role as a parent, by reminding them, maybe, maybe by those frequent reminders, at some point, your heart flips and you realize, subhanallah, I need to start being more serious about my prayers, right? But if you just abandon it all together, you're, you're leaving your children to, their, to themselves, you're no longer benefiting from, uh, you know, the reminders, and so what happens? It's just everything kind of starts to trick, fall apart. So you kind of have to just say, no, as a parent, it's my duty to make sure they're taken care of and they're doing what they should be doing. And they should, you know, and, and it's interesting because spiritually we may have these conflicts, but then when it comes to other things, I don't think we think, we think about it that way. For example, diet, right? Uh, I'm sure all parents, regardless of how they eat, right? When it comes to parenting, we're always like, no, 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 don't eat that. That's not healthy, right? It's too much sugar. It's too much, you know, um, whatever, salt, whatever it is. But we're, we're good about moderating and being moderate with our kids and keeping them on task when it comes to those issues, right? Um, or reading or, you know, education. We're good about those things. And uh, we don't really reflect our own, you know, uh, commitment to those things when we're telling them because we recognize as parents it's our duty to make sure that they're, you know, safe and that they're eating well and that they're doing their work. So, but for some reason, when it comes to spirituality, I think, and this is a clear sign for me, anyhow, that this is what's supposed to from Shaitan. Because he's trying to, you know, just divide and conquer, just kind of make everybody sort of independent and slowly kind of fall apart. Whereas, so the remedy to that is no, keep, let's keep each other accountable. Let's do things together. Let's try to pray together. Let's re recite Quran together. Let's do our dhikr together, right? Doing these things together is the remedy. Of, uh, because you're a united front against shaitan, right? Especially children, when they're so easily distracted by so many other things. It's a lot easier for them to want to pray if the whole family is praying. Then you're yelling from your room, go pray Hassan, go pray Dhuhr. And then every two seconds, did you pray? Oh, I forgot. You know, and then now you get upset with them. Why not say let's pray together? Because we're stronger when we're together, right? So just having this understanding very from the beginning and applying it across the board will alleviate a lot of the stress that parents put on themselves when you recognize the importance and the value of doing things in jama'ah in together. Our deen is a deen of jama'ah, right? We do everything together for that reason because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows we're, uh, when we're alone, we're weak. We're, when we're doing things by ourselves, we're, we're, 
we're weak because our nafs is weak, and then we have, you know, like I said, all these other distractions and shaitan is right there. So it's just, it makes it harder, but trying to do things together is a lot easier. So as parents, keep this in mind, that for my family, I am not going to make spirituality something where I'm just barking orders at my kids and telling them what to do, and I'm doing my own thing, and there's just huge disconnect. But we're going to do this as a family. We have a spiritual family culture that we're creating. Yes, you have a question? Um, so I don't, I'm so I, I get the whole doing it together and family. Mm -hmm. And you've probably often heard this where the mom is praying, yes. the dad is not praying. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and I come from a similar situation. Right. Um, you know, where my husband is not a regular, you know, five time prayer person. Right. But yet I've got, you know, all boys and you know, there's no girls either besides me and I'm mm -hmm. doing it and I where do you see this going in future? And right. you know, and I think you already probably have present day situations where parents are coming. Oh, you know, we they push, they barked orders, the mom right. did it all the time, all the time. What does that look like in like ten, five, ten years for my kids and for me? Right. In a I mean, house it's, like yeah, that. that's definitely a challenge. And I mentioned that there are going to be situations where the husband and wife are into different spiritual paths. But I think ultimately the intention should always be to uh, to bring together the family in, in a beautiful way. If it's like, you know, resentful, like let's say if you want to pray and you have, um, I don't know if you have teenage boys. They're little. They're so little. Like the oldest is nine years old. Okay, mashallah. Soon he'll be at the age where he can lead the prayer. But in the interim, you can still lead them in prayer and teach them and kind of just, again, prepare them for this beautiful role of being the imam. But also it's really good Good for you to honor your spouse's role in front of them. Mm -hmm. So even if your spouses are praying all five times of prayer, of day, prayers, if he alhamdulillah knows how to pray and he recognizes the value of prayer, it would be really good, I would say, to honor him and just say, you know, mashallah, uh, the, the uh, father the, being the imam of the family, it would be really nice if you could lead us in prayers, why don't you? And tell your boys, go ask Baba, can you please lead us in prayer because you're the imam of the house, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes men need to be reminded of their incredible role in the family, you know, and it's really good for them to hear that. And even if they're not doing all five prayers, just to have that um, support and recognition from the children, from you, to honor him, to honor his place as the leader of the, the household, in, even in spiritual matters, even if he's, you know, personally weak in certain areas, you just keep reminding him, this is your role, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to you, we recognize it, we honor you, this is a, do you see that, what that would do for him as, as being, because every father wants their children, obviously, to look at them in that way, right, to be the hero, right, every father and mother, we all want that, but it, it's important sometimes to, and gently, tactfully, beautifully send those little reminders and not to say, you don't even pray. I, you know, when we come from that place of negativity, it's, it's never going to work, right? And I'm sure you don't do that, but a lot of times, sometimes we can give in to our, our feelings in the work. moment, yeah. right? And it, it doesn't, doesn't work. work. But trying the opposite, whenever you give anything um, to someone, who a reminder, packaging is so important. And I, I say this all the time. I'm a true believer and I've done it. I've seen it. I've been a witness to it for many years. That you can relay a message to anybody as long as you're very careful in how you package it. That's why words matter, tone matters, timing matters. You have to be considerate and uh, empath being an empath is being so aware of the other person's, uh, just who they are, and we're gonna kinda of talk about that a little bit, um, that you can tailor whatever you want to say to them, as opposed to just dropping a bomb, you know? And a lot of times, sometimes our communication style is like that. I feel something, I just need to drop it. You know, without giving any consideration, is it going to be received the way you want it to be received? So I think in this situation, just gently, sort of beautifully reminding him of his role as the Imam, inviting him to lead the prayer one or two, you know, whichever prayer that you can, is a good start. And just continuing to nurture that, you know, inshallah. And of course, come to that. Yes. I have a question about prayer. So, um, <clears throat> Praying in the masjid versus mm -hmm. at home together. Yes. So in general, um, mostly in the masjid you see men. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious if there's a recommendation either way for men if they should pray, like go to the masjid and pray alone versus right. staying at home and praying in congregation with your family. That's an or taking them to the, the masjid altogether. 
Right, that's an excellent question, mashallah. And I think, you know, alhamdulillah, I would say every prayer maybe would would require its own, you know, response. Like if there's certain prayers that are easy for you to, to come to the masjid and do and it's facilitated for you, um, and it kind of works out, you know, that your family, you know, either is with you or is at home, but it's sort of easy, that's, that's, it would be recommended, obviously, to come to the masjid as often as possible. But if you're, it's a hardship for you and you're kind of forcing yourself or it's like causing extra stress just to get to the masjid and then there's other duties at home that also need to be taken care of. You know, I remember a long time ago there was a situation where a sister would complain because she had little ones, you know, and they needed milk and they needed groceries, they needed stuff. But the husband was such a stickler about praying all the prayers at the masjid that he was abandoning his duties at home to get, you know, to do that. And in that case, that would be blameworthy. Your rights, uh, you have to fulfill your rights to your family. But if those things are met, inshallah, and then you're able to, and it's not going to cause problems uh, for, for your wife and for your family, inshallah, why not? Of course, it's best, especially for the brothers. We know the hadith, there's more reward, inshallah, for praying at the masjid. So, yes, inshallah, I would think that would be recommended then. Mm -hmm. So just a small follow-up question sure. about your opinion. Um, I see there's a big division in terms of bringing your kids to the masjid. Yes. Some people say, yeah, sure, it's great. And then some people mm -hmm. say almost it's haram because they're very distracting. Right. I'm just curious if you... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love kids, and I, uh, you know, I, to me, that's, um, I feel like the masjid, especially in this day and age, we have to do our, like, due diligence to create as many beautiful memories and bonds with the masjid that we can, and that should start off, you know, when they're young. And then people might disagree with me, but I think as long as you have, you know, um, you speak to your children and teach them the adab of the masjid, teach them that, you know, it's there's certain spaces that might be okay to play around and be with your friends and, you know, have fun. But in other times, for example, as soon as the prayer starts, you know, have them pray with you, so hopefully that should resolve the distraction during the prayer time, right? But being very clear about the rules, like when the prayer starts or if there's a speaker, if there's a program happening, you have to play quietly or go somewhere else, but not kind of having, I think, this just free attitude that um, the message is like a playground. I would say not to do that, but also not to say not to come, not to bring them at all. Those are two different extremes that I think we can, the medium is very simple. Inshallah, bring them because we want to create those bonds with them and, you know, and, and have them love the space. But at the same time, uh, with their age, appropriately explaining to them the boundaries, what they can and they can't do. And if you find it's difficult, maybe they're too young. You know, there's some, and I, I, I would say not to fault them for that because children are children and it's terrible that people get to this place of, of yelling at children and shaming children. May Allah make us never do that because they're in the world of imagination. They're in the world of play and they're just being children. But we can weaken ourselves because we know our kids best determine if maybe it's too soon and hold off and, and bring them to programs or, or prayers later but not to have this fear of oh someone's gonna scold me no the masjid is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single one of us have a haq to it it's your space as much as it is mine and nobody should ever make you feel like you're not welcome here even if you bring your children but I think you know out of adab all of us should take into the consideration the other congregants and realize if, if our children may be, again, too young and, and too uh, lively and rambunctious, then maybe hold off until they're, until later, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So um, we're just, for those who are walking in, we're doing a quick review. You know, this can manifest in a few different ways. A, obviously trying our best to know him and, and study him and study how he was so that we can emulate him, right? So we have to know the Prophet you, It's hard to say, well, follow the Prophet if you don't have deep knowledge of what that means. What does that mean, right? It, just, it, just, it means to really uh, look at how he conducted himself, how he lived, how he existed, how he treated other people, his mannerisms, his disposition, and try your best to, to emulate that as, as best as possible. On Friday, you know, we were here, I was here filling in for Dr. Ranya, and uh, we took that time to talk about a very famous hadith that I personally love, that I just feel is, is just summarizes so many things um, that we can all learn from. So I'll just go ahead and read that uh, here for us as well, just so for us to reflect on. 
So Sayyidina Ali said that the Prophet uh, he said about the Prophet وسلم, the following. He said he was always cheery of disposition, easygoing and compassionate. He was not boorish or coarse, ruckus or vulgar or critical. He did not overpraise or jest, and he would ignore that which he disliked. He would not dash the hopes of anyone who hoped for something from him, and they would not be disappointed. He withheld from himself three things, debate, excess, and that which did not concern him, and he withheld from the people three things. He would never criticize or disparage anyone, he would not seek to shame anyone, and he would not speak about anything unless he hoped to be rewarded by Allah for it. Okay? So this is, again, just a summary, and you can get a pretty good image and picture of how the Prophet ﷺ was, right? Just the easygoing, cheerful part, first of all. As parents, think about that. How are you as a parent? Are you an easygoing, compassionate, cheerful parent, or are you the opposite, boorish, vulgar, critical. Take yourself into account. Because if you think being, you know, and I know it's praised a lot in this culture, um, and there's, you know, good and bad in everything, but the model that's gotten a lot of popularity is this tiger parenting, you know, uh, model, where it's just like being emotionally sort of cut off, very critical, high expectations, high standards, and not to say there's wrong, anything wrong with having high expectations and high standards, but I think even just the image of a tiger parent is, to me, a conflict. Because it's very aggressive to me, right? It's very harsh. It's, uh, it's, just, it's not uh, something that I would uh, uh, in any way associate with the parenting model that we're taught, right? The parenting model of the Prophet ﷺ, who was very gentle, right? And so I think we, we can take the good from all of these things that we might find. Okay, well, I like this aspect of it. But if it becomes a way in which we engage our children, where we're just emotionally cut off and we don't ever uh, recognize their good, even if they're doing amazing work where it's just never, you know, if they get A minuses, why isn't it an A plus? You know, that kind of attitude, I, I, don't, I don't think that's in line um, with, with the way, with the prophetic model, which is to be, again, easygoing and compassionate, understanding, and to be balanced, right? So you kind of have to just take yourself into account. How, what is my rapport with my children? Do they feel, do, affection is very important. Are you affectionate with your children? Or are you just kind of, you know, because it's not easy for you, it's not comfortable for you, maybe you weren't raised with an overly affectionate parent, so you're kind of um, just, you know, yes, you know, you kind of, you know, everything's very, very minimal in that regard, or maybe non-existent. These are all things we have to hold ourselves to account for. Yes? So like, can Living like where we do, especially in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. I feel like everything is very competitive. Yes. And to keep your kids at that high standard, while like, you know, I mean, we always try to like you know give them that affection and that love mm -hmm. and that love and every, all that stuff. But it's hard sometimes to find that balance between keeping them up to par and right. also like you know, can you elaborate on maybe how? Sure. Can? No, I agree with you. We are in a very highly competitive uh, area and time. You know, there's just it's, there's a lot of pressure on students. But I think checking in emotionally and just being available emotionally is the remedy of that. I, I don't think we should necessarily, like I said, lower the standards in terms of especially education. And, you know, Ihsan is important, and we talked about this. Having high standards as Muslims is important. We should be uh, trying to always do our best in everything. So I don't think we need to compromise that, but it's a matter of the tone that I'm speaking about, right? So as long as we're emotionally still giving and loving and understanding, like if your child didn't do well on something, instead of immediately reacting to the disappointment of you know the grade that they received and and um, blaming and shaming and getting them angry, which I know a lot of parents do because they're you know they're in mode they're they're just thinking immediately of the repercussions right a bad grade a bad test score is going to affect GPA it's going to affect college applications and it's it's just too much stress that we think about right so we immediately go to that negative place but instead really being emotionally connected to your child to say wait a second what happened you know am I, maybe I need to support you more you know maybe your load is high maybe you need a tutor maybe you need something to real but that type of 
Husnadvan, right? And and just being willing to be compassionate before you immediately get to that negative place, I think is the I mean, is how you're reacting. Right? Yes, your reactions, your tone, the um, and pausing before you. I mean, I think the reaction is is. It, it, you know, is uh, is something that we we talked about temperaments, which we'll we'll inshallah go over quickly here. But it, it's helpful to know your own temperament and your children's temperament to kind of figure out a healthy rhythm, right? Because some children don't respond well to that critical, you know, hypercritical parenting style, and you might actually shut them down. Whereas others have high, you know, they're high achievers, they're high, and it kind of, they kind of are pushed by that almost. So it's really important to be well versed in this for yourself and your children to know what's the appropriate model or, or style for each child. You know, we talked about that too. Every child is different and you have to be so in tune with your children based on their temperament, their personality type, um, to know how to communicate things effectively for them. But the one-size-fits-all model of parenting, or if I'm just, this is who I am and you have to accommodate, you know, that is, I think, what I have a problem, what I'm trying to address. Like, it's negative, it's, it causes problems in other areas. So, inshallah, just being gentle. And that's why I think, again, when we're studying the Prophet's example and we're studying his sirah, it's very clear that in so many ways, I mean, just reading through this, it's always about balance, right? He didn't over-appraise. That's really important too, because you don't want to be the opposite, where your children are making huge mistakes, but then you're so afraid of not of pushing them away that you uh, gloss over everything and you look over everything and you give them passes. And a lot of parents do that too. They're so afraid that I'm going to lose my children; they're not going to love me anymore, so they overlook everything. So the balance is the important part here, right? Being and, and trying to find that. Can I ask one more? Sure, of course, please. So like, so how? Usually how it works in our family is like, you know, my husband is more of a, you know, authoritarian. He kind of gives them that, a little bit of the hardness. Yes. And then I follow through with like being a little bit more gentle with them. And when I work with them, I'll kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, try to like calm what he's, what, the way he is down. Because that's right. his personality. He's a little stronger. Right. And he's, you know, he loves his kids. He does his best to like, you know, give them affection as well. But like when he's in that mode. Yes. That's like how he is. He's very authoritative, and like mm -hmm. so when I, you know, he sends me back them back to me, and he's like, you know, can you work with them on something? Right. Like, so I try to do it with more like, is that okay? Like that. Absolutely, and this is why when you do the st the study of personality typing, even with your kids, it's so helpful mm -hmm. because what you do is you actually explain that mommy style is this way, Baba's this way. Mm -hmm. But what it does is just kind of, you know, it, it, it validates everybody's personality differences. And it also lets children know not to take things personally, right? Because if they feel like they're being targeted because, you know, Baba's so critical or, and then Mommy's so, you know what I mean? It kind of gives them, I think, a, a false um, uh, impression of what's really happening. It's not a, tar a personal attack on anybody because that's when feelings get hurt. And then there's all these miscommunications. It's a miscommunication, right? But when you explain that, listen, we're all very different and we have different styles, and that when Baba's speaking this way to you, it's because this is literally, and then you kind of, I mean, that's why I love, you know, t uh, encouraging families to do this t together because you're giving, you're defining things that are kind of either misunderstood or just not really understood at all, and you're, you're giving uh, words to it, right? So it's like when you see certain behaviors, now you can identify that as, oh, like for example, I mean, when we get to the temperance, I'll explain better, but like, if you see a choleric te uh, per te temperament type is someone who's very reactive, right? And so if, you, if they have an intense reaction to something. So if your husband's, let's just say, for the sake of this uh, discussion, if he is a choleric personality type, then he would be very reactive and critical and harsh, right? But if your children know that, oh, okay, that's just a part of like Baba's personality type that emerges when certain things happen, but internally he's also, the, he, the, these are all the other positive qualities that Baba has, right? Then it kind of helps them understand, again, this is just who he is and it's who, how he operates, but I'm not going to sit here and think he's just being mean to me, right? Because this is unfortunately in the child's mind, if they don't understand, they'll take it personally and then all of a sudden it can fracture their, their relationship with him and then that's where the imbalance comes with you because there's more expectation from you, right, to, 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 to help them. And so it can just cause it kind of spirals, right? But when we define these things and actually give 
you know, uh, again, um, clarity, it just helps children process things better. So I have, you know, uh, people that I know, for example, if they see these personality types come out, they'll, instead of labeling even the child or the individual, they'll, it's kind of like an identity that they, that within them, and they'll go, oh, so like, Mr. Choleric is coming out now, right? But it's just a way of, again, you know, kind of not um, teaching children that this is just part of how pe human be you know, beings are. We have a design element to our personality type, and and uh, if you see that, it's okay. Just kind of remember the, their good intentions. This is your father, obviously. He loves you. He cares about you. And you know, don't don't take it so personally. He's like that with everybody. He's like that at work. He's like that with me. You know, and it's sort of like, oh, okay, I understand now, right? So that's why uh, the typing of, of, or the temperament testing is so important, and we talked about that the last one. So if you haven't had a chance to see the, the video um, that MCC posted, that's it, inshallah, it should, it should. The problem is that following his sunnah, following his ways, first that has to start with uh, studying him, right? Studying his, his story, studying his life, studying everything about him. And so there's different resources we can do that with. We can actually study his, you know, Sita intact. We can study his attributes through the, uh, the Shema'il, his physical attributes. We can study his characteristics, his, his qualities in other ways. Qadi uh, Iyad, you know, there's a text called by Qadi Iyad called Ashifa. So there's different resources that actually give you real in-depth analysis of how he was. You can do that self-study or, or study with, with your family and just really bring everybody, again, to the same understanding of how he was and then start really taking yourself into account by how are we emulating his example. So making that important. And then the, the daily du'as that he's left for us, it's very important that we all do our du'as. From the morning when we wake up and we open our eyes, there's du'a before we enter the restroom, before we get dressed for work or school. Teaching our children all of these things is a good way, again, to connect our heart to the Prophet Sallallahu because he left those du'as for us. So making sure, again, this is part of how our, our family, um, what our family does, the routine, right, of our, our day. And then Friday should be a really special day. Um, you know, I know it's hard because many parents work, but for the parents that are at home or at least get to see their children during the day uh, before, you know, the day is over, the entire uh, Thursday night until the evening of Friday is the day of Jummah, right? During that time, there should be a celebratory sort of feel in the home because, uh, you know, the Hadith, the Eid, uh, Friday is the Eid of the believer, right? So we should treat. Friday as a special day and really try to do things together. So whether that's salawat on Thursday night, some extra prayers, or having um, you know maybe a, a class on on sirah, going over a particular hadith, doing something that honors the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi These are really important practices that we can all encourage together again. And I hope the theme that of, of doing things as a unit is really getting across because I want that to be clear. Everything we're talking about isn't just individual study or assignments that you give to your kids. Where it's like, here, you know, color this dome of the Prophet's masjid, or work on this workbook, or work on this worksheet. No, it's about sitting together as a family and actually having real, in real time discussions and honoring the Prophet that way. And then, um, you know, these are other principles that we should all understand, which again, we're just doing a review. Ihsan and Ibqan, which are uh, excellence, right? Spiritual excellence, meticulousness, and, thought, uh, and thoroughness. So making sure that when we um, are teaching our children about how to be, just how to exist, that they understand this concept of Ihsan to try to also always strive for spiritual excellence, or excellence in everything. Excellence in their work, excellence in how they take care of themselves, hygiene, personal hygiene. They should be clean. Our children should be taught from a very young age to take their cleanliness serious, right? To not walk around, and you know, you see it all the time. Kids with like dirty, long nails, uh, you know, or like just food all over their face and clothing. We should teach our children to not be comfortable with that. It's not part of our tradition to do that. We, cleanliness is very, very important. But this is all, from a young age you can teach this, right? And then in their work, in their school work, in anything they do, in their chores, to not do things, again, just half-heartedly, not really wanting to do it, feeling it's a burden, and then they give you the bare minimum effort. This is something we shouldn't stand for. If they do something wrong, 
Ask them to repeat it at a higher standard. If they don't know how, take the time to teach them. Because if you let these things go, you create habits that will affect their spiritual practice. If they become people or individuals that don't have a high standard for themselves, why would we expect them to be, you know, saintly in their prayers or have, you know, high sort of uh, achievements in terms of their spiritual efforts. They're, they're going to fall short there too because they've never been, you know, pushed to, to, to try to achieve better, okay? So making sure they understand that. And then tafakkur and tadabbur, which is to reflect, to contemplate on the consequences of things. We should teach them these words. So these words we should know. We should know them as, as vocabulary words from our deen and teach them the concepts to their chil our children. To actually reflect is to go outside, to look at you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, to think about what's happening in the world, uh, globally, everything, not just in your own bubble, but to think about the bigger picture, and then to also weigh the consequences of things, to understand that every single action has a, con a, a consequence to it. And when you teach your kids to do that thought process early, then you're building their conscience, right? You're helping them build their conscience, which obviously we want them to have. As Muslims, we want them to, to be able to like really sit there and instead of us telling them right and wrong all the time, that when we're not with them, that they know what not to do. That they know what to do and what not to do. If we're not with them and they're hanging out with their friends, if you've built their conscience enough, inshallah, if a, the prayer time comes in, they're going to remember, and even if they have to be that one that says, hey guys, i got to stop playing football or soccer, we're on the court, we're having fun, but it's prayer time. right? If they have to be the one to do it, they will do it, because you've wired them to, build, to have this uh, awareness, to reflect and to weigh consequences of things. So it's very important to do that at a young age. And then, muraqaba, to meditate, right? to watch over and, uh, your spiritual heart to really just think about you know, uh, whatever you need to do individually and to teach your children. Some kids respond well to doing dhikr, some kids like to pray, some kids like to read the Quran, right? So whatever it is. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Waalaikum salam. So I'm just hearing in terms of what you're saying, in terms mm -hmm. of doing things together. Yes. But I also hear like just as adults and parents in the household of mm -hmm. a really um, explicit need Mm -hmm. about how we're going to um, commit to the, what we call home training. Yes. Um, and raising our children, like that's just not, it's not accidental. Absolutely. Um, not just osmosis, but the adults really- A hundred percent. Unify. Yes. Um, and cooperate. Um, because I think it's hard to do that. Right. It's not impossible, but you have that, there has to, it's, it's, it has to be like, you know what I mean? Of like, course. Because I think for kids, it sends mixed messages. Um, and it's hard for them to understand, you know, like with one parent, it's okay mm -hmm. to do this, right. but with this other parent, it's not. I agree. Or, you know, yeah. like, go make salat, but like, what is the impact? If, if our children don't see the impact of salat on us, right. you know, like, that's the best quote-unquote seller, you know what I mean? Absolutely. We're out of salat, and then we're barking, or we're doing whatever, mm -hmm. or as adults, we don't even apologize to our children when we're in the wrong. Right. You know, so things like that, but I, and so I'm hearing just, you know, in terms of collective, yes. um, but also I think a collective mindset Absolutely. as well, you know, that goes Absolutely. along with that. No, Jazakal Khan, you're 100% right. We need to, and that's why parents need to be on the same page. Even if, like I said, they're on spiritual different, spiritually different courses, they have to see the common mutual benefit of being on the same page when it comes to raising their children. And not to, to, to do that the whole thing where I was, you know, I don't know if, if you walked in a little late, but I addressed that if you're not doing what you need to be doing spiritually, and you think that because of that, you shouldn't have any part in the spiritual welfare of your children. That's it. That's not. That's not right. Even if you're weak in certain areas, your priority should be to do the best by your children, right? And not to say, just like I said, you know, as far as health or other areas of concern, we don't do that whole thing like what well, it's a reflection, right? So as as parents, yeah, you need to come together and have a very serious conversation. Like, listen, wherever we are individually on our path, that's between us and Allah. May Allah guide us to whatever which is best. But when it comes to our children, can we please have a united front? Can we please have a united way of parenting them when it comes to their spiritual practice and all of these things? Because we have to do right by them. We have to give them the best. 
right? And if we're going to shortchange ourselves and our own souls, that's on us. But we shouldn't let that, you know, affect our way of parenting our children. It's irresponsible to do that. And I think that kind of also does take some pressure off, even maybe secular parents or parents who are just not religious at all, because they realize, you know what, fine, I, I, for me, myself, I mean, unless they completely don't believe and you're really dealing with a different set of issues, but if they are, you know, alhamdulillah, rec they recognize that they're, they're nominally or at least, you know, in practice in some areas they're Muslim, but they have short, you know, comings or they're weak in certain areas, I hope that by having a really important discussion with the spouse who maybe is the, the more active one, that they will see the, the benefit of just abandoning their own individual, you know, you know per perspectives or, or opinions on certain things and just saying it's about the best for the children. And whatever is the best for the children I'm going to do. So I'm going to support them praying five times a day. I'm going to encourage them to pray five times a day. I have friends who are, uh, you know, uh, married to, to people who are not Muslim, but it's the non-Muslim parents who will tell the, their children, go pray. Right? It's the non-Muslim parents who recognize the value for their children to be doing these things, even though they don't do it themselves. So this is really good. You know, this is the kind of mindset we should have. And, and that's where um, I hope that by attending these types of programs together, right, we can kind of come together, couples can come together with, uh, you know, some, some a mutually uh, understood and accepted agreement about how, how to do this. But you're right, there's, you know, there's definitely, you need a collective mindset in order for this to succeed. And so that, that is, you know, the, the starting ground. If you feel like your spouse might um, be, you know, it's just, it's going to be difficult for you, then present this to them. Like, listen, I want to start doing things differently because our children's souls are at stake here. You know, the world outside wants to devour literally our children's souls. I mean, they're re it's ready. It's just everything's already in place. You know, from, from everything you see uh, in social media, in media in general, and just the society outside, the, the, you know, the, the, the spiritual health of the child matters very little. They're just consumers, and that's all they are to, to the world outside. So if you really recognize that, then hopefully as, as parents you'll come together, inshallah, and see what can we do to protect our children, and we need to have a united front, so let's start implementing these different things. And then, you know, take pace yourself. This is, can't be done overnight if you're not doing it. It's not something that you could just, you know, instantly have everything a certain way. It has to be done by priority, and priority is, the prayers are absolutely priority, connecting with the problems license is absolutely priority. These are things, that's why, thank you, thank you for your comment. And so uh, the last point here is muhasaba, you know, self-inventory, again, taking yourself into account, teaching your children to do this every day. And this can be done as a, as a, you know, as a dinner discussion even, you know, where everybody kind of looks back at their day and says, what was your, you know, high point? What did you do uh, today that was a good thing that you're proud of? And is there anything that you did that you weren't proud of? And seeing what, t what sharing, you know, happens. This is... Communication is just so important. You know, I think I, I read something recently about children and how, um, you know, the different distractions they have, whether it's television or social media. And part of the study also accounted for the time that they spent having serious conversa conversations with their parents. And it was less than, um, I think it was less than five minutes for sure, maybe three minutes of actual conversation with their parents on a day-to-day -day basis, as opposed to hours online, playing video games, watching TV, socializing with their friends. So if you're thinking, like, you think about that. What type of influence could you possibly have with your children if you're barely speaking to them for five minutes a day and then they have all these other influences? So when you have these types of practices in place, they force you to do things together. They force you to look at each other, to have conversations, to actually connect emotionally with each other so that you're not just strangers that live in the same home, right, and eat, and eat the same meals, but you actually are communicating about what's happening to you on a daily basis. So that's why these are so important. Now just to kind of move quickly again because we have more content to cover. So, you know, again, two other concepts that um, felt were really important is t teaching our children how to protect their heart by A, being simple yeah. in their generosity, okay? Because a lot of times, children, um, mashallah, they do have good yeah. natures and they can be very giving. You know, they want to, to be 
accepted by their peers, they want friends, they want you know everybody to love them, so they might give too much of themselves, of their, uh, whatever it is they have, their possessions, their money, their wealth, you see kids getting taken advantage of a lot. So we have to teach our children, obviously generosity is very important in our faith, but to be you know, prudent in our generosity, to be wise and to not feel that you have to always please every single person and give every single thing to, to, you know, to everyone around you, but to just kind of, again, so that, this again, practices, and if you emulate that, then they can follow, obviously, your lead, but just having them, you know, learn that, and then also, very important is to mind their own business. I think a lot of kids, especially when you reach a junior high and high school ages, they get in trouble a lot because they're, they haven't been wired to just be like, I'm staying out of that, you know? I, I, they, because everything in this society is about wanting to know, you know? We live in a you know, tabloid society where it's very gossip and like wanting to know everybody's business and now with like social media and like, you know, these instant videos and everybody's got quick little, you know, whether it's memes or whatever it is, uh, up within two seconds when something happens, it's just this, this, um, this need to know everything. But you have to teach your children, and you also also have to again practice this yourself. That I'm not going to care about things that don't have to do with me, and I'm going to turn that just mechanism off. Like I'm just I'm not interested. And uh, and so when they're at school, and if their kid friends are get into something or something's happening, there's a fight or whatever it is. I mean, kids, you know, they they, they get riled up very easily. But if they're again no, like no 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 no, that's trouble. I don't want to be you know I don't want to go down that road then inshallah it'll protect them. But these have to be things again you talk about as concepts. Because if you're just saying, you know, just saying it, like mind your own business, without connecting it to the spiritual, like this is your hadith, you know? The Prophet have taught us these concepts. But why? Let's have a discussion about it. Why do you think he would explicitly tell us, right? <laughs> why would he tell us that the excellence, part of the excellence of a person's Islam is, my, is leaving that which does not concern us. What do you think? What's the benefit of that? Right? And then kind of letting that get into a family discussion, letting it sink in so that, again, you're planting these ideas, these seeds for them, so that when they're in, facing a situation, hopefully, inshallah, we can only pray that it wakes them up, you know? And that's the thing is that we have to know we don't control outcomes. We talked a lot about that during the first session. We just can control what we do. Whatever happens is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we can do as parents is do our best to protect them, right? So teaching them these concepts. Now, and then we, we went over uh, leadership basics in Islam, which we're going to get to in, in, in a little bit. I'm going to repeat this slide. So, and then we talked about the power of five. So this is, you know, again, something for all of us to just remember and to, to, to know well. That there's this magic ratio, according to experts, called the five to one ratio, and it's a ratio of positive to negative comments. So if you can keep your positive to negative comment ratio to five to one, this is a very healthy standard for any relationship, okay? whether it's your marriage or your relationship with your children. But if you, you know, are more critical or more negative, then you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of problems because it's going to build resentment and eventually it might just, you know, cause, cause irreparable damage to your relationship. So you really want to, again, hold yourself accountable. As a parent, how positive am I? You know, as a spouse, when I come in home after a long day's work, am I immediately um, negative and just, why didn't get this done? Why didn't get that done? Do I hear that from my kids a lot that I'm, uh, always annoyed and cranky and upset, or why am I so mad all the time? Or my spouse, do I hear that? If you're hearing that, this is where you have to take yourself into account. How can I change? So just remember, five to one, hold yourself accountable. And then we talked about the five love languages. So again, very important for all of us to, um, to study. This is uh, a book, I can't remember if it's Chapman or John Gray. I don't think it's John Gray, I think it's maybe. Is it Chapman? Okay, Chapman, thank you. Um, that he wrote this book on the five love languages, and this is very helpful because you need to know how you want, you love, how you want to be loved, and teach that to your spouse first and foremost, and then your children, and and also learn how they want to be loved. 
because it's important not everybody loves the same we don't communicate exactly the same and this is why really getting in touch with yourself is so important in terms of knowing who you are what your needs are which is what the theme of, of our conversation will be today inshallah a little bit more on this so you know um and then we talked about the temperaments the four temperaments in islam we kind of went through this so i'm just going to again Go through this quickly because this is a lot of this content is available on the previous video. You can go through it. But we talked about this ancient science of the four temperaments that was um, founded by Hippocrates, the, the father of modern medicine, and then later developed by Galen, another Greek philosopher, and then Ibn Sina. And they had this idea basically that human behavior can be determined based on different fluids and the balances of different fluids in the system. And so if you take a test, uh, it'll help you determine what your temperament is. And then it identifies different characteristics and qualities of each temperament. I know the slides that are really small, but the four temperaments are. The first one is a choleric, okay, is an, an intense sort of personality type. They're a type A, very high, high achieving people, high standards, very reactionary, extroverted. Um, and so they have, you know, good positive and negative qualities, but it's, uh, you know, they like to have it their way, they like control. So again, you should know, is this who I am? Is this, does this kind of relate to me? Am I the type of person that really does like to have things done my way and it's hard for me to give up control to other people? And if I'm reactionary, you're likely a choleric, okay? Um, excuse me. Then we have um, sanguine which is also an extroverted personality type, but they're a little different. They're reactionary, but they're more the bubbly life of the party, very uh, popular, they, they just really like connecting with people, they're chatty, they're always, you know, just kind of, always in a good mood, it seems like, okay? Um, and so, again, the, the popularity and being well-known and well-liked is really important for them. So if you're a people pleaser, if you're just always eager and, and the one that says yes to everybody's requests and you're always, available to help people, then you likely are a sanguine, especially if you have that really cheerful disposition that we talked about earlier. Okay, so again, knowing this for yourself and then trying to figure out um, who everybody is in the family is also very helpful. But there's actual tests, um, you know, we're just kind of going over it, summarizing these things quickly, but there are tests to help you determine what you are. Then we have phlegmatic. These are more peace-loving, very calm uh, energy people. They just like um, you know, harmony, they're very relationship oriented, they're not very reactionary at all. They're kind of the more subdued, passive personality type, okay? Um, and it takes time for them to, 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 you know, confront issues and problems. They're not like the type that are, you know, going to take things on head on. They need to process. Very thoughtful people, okay? And then the last one is the melancholic. These are your um, introverted. Uh, highly analytical, very pragmatic, black and white world. You know, you either, it's right or wrong, you know, and uh, they, they can be very, very critical. Um, and they're, they're hard to kind of uh, open up emotionally. It's not easy for them. So they can be an enigma. It's very hard to figure them out. So if you or your spouse is like that, again, it's good to know this because it can help you determine what areas you might need to work on. Because it's not to say that just because these are your, this is your temperament, that's it, you just accept it. No, every single one of us from a spiritual perspective has our own mujahida, right? Our own uh, struggle. And our struggle individually is to better ourselves to make ourselves in line with the Prophet Whatever that means, whether it's working on the diseases of the heart, or working on, again, looking at the way that we engage with other people. If people, like, and we talked about this on Friday too, but if you walk into a room and you have a heaviness and a constricting presence, you're not warm and welcoming, you can be cold, and people might have told you that, that you're very uh, cold and you're just seeing, you know, like you're just not, you don't have that warmth. This is something that you want to work on. It's not, you shouldn't be like, well, it's just who I am. No, because it's not in line with the, the, the Prophet's example. And his example is what we're all supposed to try to come, you know, to, to, to meet. Wherever you are in this, you know, spectrum, we all have something to work on. And so we have to recognize where we are, though, first. And then we can recognize where we have to go, right? What we have to do to get there. So this is very important to take these tests and you can find them online. There's a book I recommended called The Temperament That God Gave You. Um, and you can look it up in the library. There's you know, copies of Barnes & Noble if you just wanna skim through it first. 
uh, or purchase it right away from Amazon, whatever your options are that, uh, or you prefer. But there's tests in that book and there's also online tests that you can take that help you determine your temperament and then help you with your children. Now, this is a study that I would say, don't just keep it to yourself. You have to share it with your family. Have your spouse take the test. Have each child take the test. Yes, even younger children can take the test. You can help them take it. It's just a questionnaire. But what that does is it gives you something to work with. Because now I understand, wow, okay, if I'm a choleric and everybody else is a melancholic, for example, wow, that's pretty serious, you know, intense you know, personality types that we all have in the home. No wonder maybe sometimes our conversations are hard, right? Or if you have a, you're a sanguine, and you're just always chipper and happy and you're dealing with a spouse who's just very serious and not easy to connect with and you're like man i can't no matter what i do everybody loves me i, can, I love everybody but this just can't get through to him or her then this again it helps to for you to realize like you know what don't take it personally it's not that he doesn't or she doesn't love you it just might very well be that this is their personality type and that you have to now uh, work with it and there are ways you know to, to, to or areas where you can study further to figure out how can we um, work better when we have different uh, conflicting or completely oppositional personality types okay so this is sort of a summary of um, again our last session now for today uh, you know again because we're talking about um, you know that, that list that I kind of skimmed through uh, before, I want to go back to that real quick. But before we get there, in the very first session we talked about this hadith. Okay, ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati. Okay, this is a hadith of the Prophet Very important that you, you know this hadith, okay? It's very, it's longer, but the short of it is right there. Every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his or her flock. We talked about this because this hadith is, is is in my you know opinion, and I'm sure many uh, people would agree, is is I think the best analogy for parenting, okay, because it talks about shepherding. The idea that the shepherd, what is what does the shepherd do? What is their objective, right? The shepherd's sole objective is to do three things: to nurture, to guide, and to protect their flock, right? Is that not the objective of all of us as parents? Don't we want those same three things? To nurture, to guide, and to protect our children. So in every way, when you look at the behavior, the actions, the, 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 the tasks of a, of a shepherd, they're very similar to that of a parent. Okay? And we kind of dissected this very thoroughly, looking at you know, just the way the shepherd walks, his staff. We kind of picked each part of the shepherd and went into what that means, and we concluded that these uh, objectives uh, that he, um, oh, excuse me, these things that the, that the shepherd aims for to nurture, guide, and protect um, can be achieved only through, or not only, but, but through three key objectives, which are what? Control, okay, through education and skills. So if you want to do, if you want to nurture, guide, and protect your children, you need to establish control first. You need to know what you're doing. Shepherd doesn't just walk out there without knowing how animals behave, without knowing how to feed them, how to you know, protect them. He needs to acquire knowledge, right? Then reach, and this is done through communication and creativity. And then safety, uh, and that's done through planning and precaution. So as parents, we're going to talk about how what the what these three objectives mean. So we're kind of in these first few sessions focusing on that first objective, which is control, establishing control. All of us are here, obviously, because we want to be more effective in our parenting. We we're having these discussions because we want we're you know we're, we're we want to hold ourselves in to to a higher standard and learn how to do things better. And so this is where education matters. We have to start with education, right? And and learning about personality, human behavior, temperaments. Child, children, how children behave, right? The needs of children. Um, and then also, obviously, from a spiritual perspective, what our rights and obligations are. We're trying to understand all of that. And then we're looking at different parenting models, different psycho psychological tools that are out there. So we're in the education phase right now. So these workshops right now, that's what we're doing. And so for today, I wanted to talk about this, um, you know, the slide that I had before about leadership basics in Islam. So if we recognize, right, for effective parenting, we, we need to understand, I mean, from, from again, going back to education, 
You can't be an effective parent if you're not an effective leader, right? If you don't know how to lead, you're not going to be able to be a parent because parenting is literally leading. That's what you're doing. So what are the uh, goals? The ones that are underlined are what we're going to talk about today. Understanding ourselves well, our own needs, understanding the, the other people in our care well, that includes your spouses and your children, and then their needs. So these four areas are where all of us should be right now, if, especially if you're attending these sessions. Inshallah, your objectives, as I said, are clear. So you should be in this mode of trying to figure out yourself first, okay? And I know when you think of parenting, it's like immediately we want to jump into children. Yeah, that's important, but again, it's so much related to us as individuals. If we're not clear on who we are, how do we possibly understand our children and then effectively lead them? If we're neglecting ourselves, we don't, we're not you know, in tune with who we are. So it has to start with the self. And of course, you know, this is another, you know, maxim in our tradition. Whoever knows their, their nafs well, right, their, their themselves well, they'll know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well. So if we want to spiritually develop and become better, we have to start with self-knowledge, okay? So let's just get into the discussion. Do you know what you need? If I asked you what does any human being need to survive, what would you say? What is it? Depends. Basic, okay, basic, basic survival needs of a human are what? Food, Food water, shelter, water shelter, shelter, air, right? I mean air, I mean subhanAllah, we're feeling that right now, are we not? Right, we're, we're in a situation where subhanAllah, I'm sure maybe it's been a long time since, since many of us made some serious shukr for clean air, right? Right, but that's something we take advantage of or we take for granted, you know, we, we, uh, we don't realize what a nema it is to have clean air. But now that we're breathing through masks and coughing every two seconds, we suddenly are aware of that, right? So these are very basic human needs. That was pretty easy to figure out, right? We all need shelter, we all need uh, food, water, air, we need love, right? But what about thriving? What does a human being need to thrive, to become their best optimum self? Okay? And is there a correlation? I'm sorry? A sense of security. A sense of security. Very good. Alhamdulillah. Yes, absolutely. And obviously from a spiritual perspective, I mean, if you want to thrive or succeed, you cannot do that without nurturing, right? your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, uh, that, and that's, for, for us, it should be very clear. The measure of success according to our tradition is right, it starts and ends right there. Where are you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So if you want to see uh, yourself reach your highest potential, you can't do that if you're only focusing on material wealth and gain or other er things, right? It has to be done through that process of I need to really work on my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if, as long as I'm focused there and I'm committed there and I'm proving myself there, inshallah that's the measure of success, right? That's the ultimate <coughs> so we should be clear on that. So let's, you know, this is a quote from uh, Maslow, okay? And I wanted to just read this quote. So for the man who is extremely and dangerously hungry, no other interests exist but food. Life itself tends to be defined in terms of eating. Anything else will be defined as unimportant. Freedom, love, community feeling, respect, philosophy may all be waved aside as fripperies which are useless since they fail to fill the stomach. Such a man may fairly be said to live by bread alone. But what happens to a man's desire when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? At once, other and higher needs emerge, and these, rather than physiological hungers, dominate the organism. And when these, in turn, are satisfied, again, new and still higher needs emerge, and so on. This is what we mean by saying that the basic human needs are organized into a hierarchy of, rel of relative propotency. Okay, so what is this? This is, again, in other words. In order for human beings, for us to achieve higher, to aim higher, to feel more motivated towards being better, we have to make sure that our innate needs are first fulfilled. Okay, and then so that's obvious: the food, shelter, water. 
And then that gives us, once those are fulfilled, it gives us energy to motivate ourselves to seek out higher things, okay? So why is this important? Because when it comes to parenting, we have to see where are we in terms of this hierarchy? What are we type, what, where are we in terms of providing this first for ourselves and then for our children, okay? So let's look. So this is um, the hierarchy that he's outlined. So he, and it starts from the bottom. So I, I wrote it in reverse, but it, it goes up. So physiological needs must be met first, then safety, love, belonging, esteem, and then self-actualization. And that's like the highest level. When you've reached that place, that's when you become your best version, okay? But in order to get there, according to this theory, or you know, his, his, his uh, idea, is that you have to meet all these other first. So here's a visual for you. So physiologically, if we can meet our basic needs, right, then we're able to move past those needs and we can focus on the next set of needs, which are security, uh, of employment, right, of resources, family, health, prosperity, uh, property. Now, I want you to think, if you are having problems in your home, in your marriage, in your health, at work, do you see what happens is, you get stuck because your needs aren't being fulfilled. So when you're stuck, it's hard to go to the next place. And so I want every every person, and this is again in order to, to in order to for us to you know see ourselves in this, but also look at our homes, look at the people in our lives that, that matter, especially when it comes to marriage. We should look at your spouse and see where are where am I versus where are they. Because if you're having you know, marital issues and it's affecting your house and it's just causing a lot of problems, issues, what are, what's happening? Why am I at some place and my spouse isn't there or vice versa, right? And so this kind of helps you understand that, that if you are in a place, let's say you are in a place of um, you know, self-actualization where you're just wanting to really spiritually, you, know, you have all these ambitions and goals, you want to take classes, you want to you know, go on these incredible trips, you want to make Omra, you want to do Hajj, you know, a lot of, there's couples, I, I've talked to several, where it's like one is on that trajectory, they just have such high aims and goals, and then their spouse isn't quite there, right? And they're frustrated, because it's like, you know, I want them to be there, they're not listening, they don't, you know, they don't, they're not really there. Maybe if you understood where they are with their needs, it might give you some understanding and perspective. Maybe your needs are met. Maybe, alhamdulillah, you came from a family and an upbringing where you were loved, right? You had plenty of, of a security growing up, right? Because we have to take these things into consideration. If you come from a household where your parents were together and they were very affectionate and your siblings and everybody's just super lovey-dovey and then you, you never had to worry about your meals and, you know, everything was taken care of for you, you had you know, a lot of privilege and opportunity, and then, you know, you, it obviously, I mean, look at this, if, if you get all of these things, it leads to the next level. So if you have safety, it leads to love and belonging. So you have a lot of friends, your family relationships are secure, everything just sort of, mashallah, beautiful. And then that leads to what? Higher self-esteem. You're more confident. You're more, uh, you know, maybe outgoing, right? You're more social, because your, uh, your confidence level has been facilitated with all these needs being met. And so then that takes you to the next level where it's like, okay, kids are growing up, now I want to develop myself, I want to start taking classes, I want to do this, I want to find, you know, and you, there's people who are like that, they're in this place, but then they look at their spouse, spouse isn't quite there, right? Spouse is, is still, they're not, you know, maybe spiritually there, they're negative, they're closed off emotionally, uh, there's some, well, Let's get to the root of it. Where, where's the disconnect? Have you figured out, are there needs being met? So this is where you have to look at yourself. Are my needs being met? Do I feel um, you know, safe and secure? Or am I worried about my home and having a roof over my head, you know, my, paycheck to paycheck? I mean, if you're living like that, especially here in the Bay Area, that's going to cause you a lot of stress, is it not? There's people who are literally struggling. They don't know what if, if they're going to have a job at the end of the week or at the end of the month. And then they have to worry about bills and, and kids' school and, and all the other stuff that, ha you know, payments and insurance and everything else that pe people really, you know, worry about. So how is that going to affect 
again, all these other areas and parts of, of, of you that you want to obviously develop and you want to become better and you want to improve on, but if you're stuck because a need isn't being met, do you see how it's going to prevent you from growth? So it's important to understand where your needs are and then to see how can we remedy that? What can we do? Because if you're just expecting, sometimes I think we look at people um, not you know, with, with really true understanding, we just look at them as, as a whole, and if we're not happy with the whole, we're just not happy with the whole. But when you actually start to understand the different, you know, look at, looking at a person as, as being much more uh, multifaceted, you know, and there's different things happening that are independent of you, and not making everything about you, then you increase your empathy for them, you increase your understanding for them, and you can maybe hopefully try to help them to realize, like, you know what, maybe you're, you know, you're in this situation or you're not feeling, you know, motivated because this particular need isn't being met. Let's focus on that, right? So this is something that it's very important to study because, and we're going to talk about how um, this affects children as well. So, um, Let's actually get to that slide. So for children, it's similar, very similar, um, but we should know this is what children need. So as parents, first work out your own needs, determine what areas you need more of or what you need to work on. And that's why you know I've talked about this in many previous sessions, but if you are feeling emotionally depleted or there's just, you're just not, you're not, there's something you know is wrong or you know that, we all, I think, have a pretty good, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of just a, we know when something's off, right? So listen to yourself. Listen to that part of you that says, you know, you've been pretty down for a long time. You've been um, unhappy. You've been unsatisfied, whether it's with your work or with your family life, or maybe there's a relationship that's very toxic and it's affecting you and it's affecting your own confidence, your own just happiness altogether. Just sitting in that um, and being, you know, defeated and not really having a plan of action obviously only exacerbates your problem because it's a vicious cycle. You're going to stress and worry about it and that stress and worry causes other problems, right? Physically, mentally, emotionally. So just, you know, realize that you have to be in tune with yourself and realize if you're not happy about something, there are ways to, inshallah, get, you know, to get relief. Whether it's spiritual and you just khalas are gonna become, I don't know, there's something like, if it's a health matter and you know, you there's really no course, may Allah give you shifa, of course, we always have hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if you're in a situation where you have a health problem that you just really don't have much, uh, you know, way of, of, of fixing or, or, or uh, curing, then your remedy could be just spiritually, I'm just gonna focus on my, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really try to, to, to do whatever I need to get, you know, to just to, to strengthen that. But if there's other things, like if it's a relationship issue, you know, for, there's so many now opportunities for you to get help. There's so many opportunities for you to actually work on improving that relationship. But actually feeling inclined to doing that instead of just saying, well, it is what it is. God, I can't do anything about it. And a lot of people have that very complacent attitude about their problems. Like, I can't do anything about it. Just I just got to deal with it. No, that's a shaitan. He wants you to be in despair. He wants you to be miserable. But subhanAllah, our deen is not a deen of hopelessness. Right? We should never uh, feel settled with being hopeless. And so if you have needs that need to be met, you have to look around and say, where are the resources that I can get help? And be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to share with people, obviously professionals, with people that are, you know, I'm not saying to go out there and just complain about your problems to everybody, but seek out help. I think for some reason, I, I, you know, in the work that I do, I just feel like there's just this, you know, given up. People have just given up in so many different areas. It is to their own detriment. And uh, so that's why it's so important, again, to have these conversations and to be self-aware, to realize that like, I shouldn't be settled. If I'm not feeling happy, I need to work on it. I need to figure out what, that, what, what the solution is and actually be empowered to do something about it, inshallah. But if you're not aware of your needs and you just don't care and you're just living robotically and mechanically and your whole day is just going to work and coming back and eating and sleeping and there's just no deep connection with your soul, 
then yeah, you're, that's just your existence. And eventually, you know, you're just going to wither away and that's it. That's, that's it. That's all. That's, that's the chapter of your life. You know, that's, I mean, that's the, the story of your life. You know, just someone who was okay with misery and just didn't really want to do anything further. No, we have to push back against that and say, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, trials and tribulations are part of this dunya, but we always have hope. We always expect better, and we are always to strive for better, right? So meeting our needs first, and then looking at our children's needs. So children, they need the same. They need the physiological needs met first, so making sure we're providing for them healthy, obviously, food, um, sleep, making sure their sleep is, is you know, is good and, and not, you know, especially if you have teens, please, and I, I'm, you know, they, no, no teenager has, <laughs> has paid me to say this, but I really, because I work with teens a lot, and I remember, I really remember my own struggle as a teenager. We as parents have to be much more sympathetic to our teens because they're going through major physiological changes and sleep is a huge need. I have literally done uh, you know, sessions with teens and I'm like, what is the one thing that you, if you could have the most of? They're not talking about money and fame and wealth. They're li they will say sleep. That's the first answer. But I think a lot of parents, you know, especially if you again come from that you know, highly critical you know, parenting model, it's just like, no, get up, stop being lazy. And you're always barking at your children for wanting to sleep. That's not fair. They're going through major, major changes and we have to be a little bit more understanding. It's just like the infant. The infant's brain is going through all these changes, right? And we don't wake up an infant who needs to sleep for long stretches of a time because they're changing. We understand that. Adolescents go through the same process just years later. So be more understanding about your teen's need for sleep and try to accommodate it. Do you want a nap? We can nap before we have to go to this party. Why don't you go take a nap? It's okay. I'll do this. I'll do You know, just to help. Look at that. Be more sympathetic. Because it's a, it's a basic need. And then you want them to go and you know, write or work on uh, projects for hours and hours on end and be up until one o'clock in the morning because you better not turn that in late. And we're just so intense with that, but then we don't realize that we're not meeting their basic need, but then we want them to achieve, you know, in this very intense, high pressure, you know, uh, competitive time with, a, with a, you know, it's, just, it's too much. Yes, I think, it, is your hand up? Yes, please. Yeah, I just have a few things. Elaborate on sympathetic because I'm learning. And mm -hmm. I feel like I've, I've realized as a parent, like yes. you're an elementary teacher, a middle school teacher, and a high school teacher, <laughs> and your strength might be in elementary when your kids are in middle school. You know yes. what I mean? But I also wonder, just my struggle, just in terms of father and teenagers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Whether it be as five or six, or even at the latest in a father, mm -hmm. and that dichotomy of, okay, I know you need to sleep, but also it's time right. for father. You know what I mean? And so just that struggle right. um, is real. No, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because it's important. If you're waiting for your teens to become teens and then you expect them to pray fudger, this is what I would say is a problem. Prayers need to start, what are the age? Between 7 to 10 is when you start disciplining and teaching your children how to play. By 10, they should be praying their five prayers. So I think that's pre-adolescent. What you're doing is you're creating habits for them before they reach the age of like, you know, feeling like a log in bed and they can't, they literally feel like they can't get up. It's, they're, they've already accustomed their muscles to it, they know, their brains are wired, you know, my, my son, alhamdulillah, he's, he's turning 10 next month, but this year, since uh, Ramadan, alhamdulillah, he's been praying all of our, all the prayers with us, and mashallah, may Allah protect and preserve it for him, but he is our alarm clock half the time, he wakes up way before us. And he'll be the one who comes and wakes us up for Fajr. Because he's nine years old, but we started him for that reason. And this is the wisdom of Islamic parenting. Because they tell you, start early. Don't wait until they're 12 and 13. And now it's like, oh, it's fun of them. You have to do it. And you're intense and you're pressuring them. And then you wonder why it's hard for them. They haven't been habituated to it. So I would say work early on establishing that practice for them. But also be understanding that if, you know, Look at their sleep, um, because uh, understand how sleep cycles work. Like I had to educate myself about sleep cycles because I didn't know, and you know, if there's any physicians in the room, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe like a full, good quality, uh, you know, block of sleep is about an hour and a half. And this is how you, when you hit REM, and you actually can feel, if you wake up and you feel like a little bit refreshed, it's because you've gotten your deep sleep and it takes about an hour and a half for a cycle. So if you are, uh, not timing your sleep and fudger so that you can hit those marks, 
what's going to happen is you might wake them up in the middle of that one and a half hour block and that's when you get the oh I can't get up right so we should educate ourselves like you know what time your sleep so that by the time Fajr comes inshallah you will have complete you're not completely you know burdened and this all of us can learn from this if you have a hard time with Fajr I bet you it's because that's what's happening you're interrupting the middle of your sleep cycle and that's why it's so difficult because the, this whole, you know, and I don't know, I, I, you, you read different things and I get it, there's different, you know, studies that are done, but I think there's this feeling that sleep, you have to get this number of sleep, uh, and everybody, if you don't get a certain number of hours of sleep, you're just, you know, you're going to be, you can't function. That's not the case for everybody. Many, many people can function on very little sleep per night because they know how to time their sleep cycles accurately. So that's why, you know, I mean, in our tradition, for example, it's, it's known, you know, the Prophet he did the hijjid every night. And many of the greatest, they, would, they were known to sleep very little at night because their nights were meant for worshiping Allah. But what did they do? They compensated during the day, they would take naps, even, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah was to do the Qaylula, which is the na after afternoon nap, right, between Allah and Asr. So this, or, or is it Asr and Maghrib? Asr and Maghrib? Like, yeah, Asr and Maghrib, right? So, uh, but, but, you know, to do those prayers during that time, this is a practice, but why? Because it's, again, wisdom. It teaches us that sleep is like a nafs, right? If you indulge it and you become habituated to sleeping stretches of 10 hours, don't think that that's just me. I love to sleep. I like to. I need to sleep that much. No, you've just you know accustomed your body to wanting that type of sleep because you've given in to this you know to this to this habit. Train yourself, you know, and start being smart in how you sleep. It's not quantity; it's quality. So with your children, do the same thing. If they're having a hard time with certain prayers. Target that. Look, let's look at when you're sleeping, and let's wake up at times that are going to not interrupt that cycle, inshallah. And then, you know, inshallah, they can, if they have time after they pray, go back to bed, get an another little quick, you know, cat nap before they have to get up for school. But be understanding is what I'm saying. If on the weekends they don't want to go to every family party because they'd rather sleep, don't uh, be angry with them. Stop and say, you know what? Okay, it's okay. You know, your needs are also important. Because I think sometimes we, we put our own needs first and, you know, they're going to get mad and they're going to have to answer to these people and they're not going to understand. Well, you know what? They, maybe they need to understand. Maybe they need to understand that your children are, you know, overscheduled and overburdened and they're exhausted and they're human beings. So you have to be the defenders sometimes of your children and not give in to the pressure of I'm going to get, you know, uh, yelled at or someone's not going to like me. You know what? You can't cater to everybody. And that's just, I think we just have to stop doing things on those, you know, pretenses. Because we uh, compromise our relationship with our children. If you're willing to literally, you know, be, uh, you know, have no sympathy for your child for the sake of someone else that you might see once a year, I mean, to me that's very strange, you know. Why don't you tell that person I'm sorry they couldn't make it, you know, and let your child know, I love you, I know you're so exhausted, you work so hard during the week, may Allah bless you and give you tawfiq in all you do, because I'm so proud of you, you get to home, stay home, just, stay, just rest, you know, there's food in the fridge, enjoy your time, I mean, what kind of a relationship are you going to inculcate with your child if that's the kind of parenting model you have, where you literally know their needs and you understand their needs and you don't, uh, dismiss their needs as being frivolous little teenage complaints and whininess and laziness and stuff like that. But this is, you know, again, being aware of our needs, being aware of their needs. This is what the educate. This is why this education is so important because it connects you, you know, to them where they're at, not where you're just standing and you're expecting them to meet you where you're at. You know, see where they're at. You know, build that understanding. So. Um, Again, physiological needs are the most base, then they need obviously safety and security. Okay? And this is where, as, adult, uh, you know, our, as adults and caretakers, we have to make sure that their, their needs are met. We have to be vigilant, make sure that who they are around, um, that they're safe you know, around the people that we expose them to or leave them with. So that's our duty in making sure that you know, even when it comes to their, um, their health, you know, making sure they have adequate health care, and they're obviously free from any type of abuse and neglect. So if you have an abusive, um, you know, personality type where you, you know, are really hard on your kids, you got to take yourself into account here. You're not meeting their basic need of safety and security. And you will not, and you cannot expect them to become, 
better and to become the better versions of themselves if they're living in fear, you know? They're living in fear because you're, you're abusive. You know, unfortunately, this, these are very common issues in our community where parents are, are very, very you know, abusive towards their kids and they don't realize that that type of, t there's no such thing as, you know, that whole tough love excuse. No, it's not tough love to, to be abusive and to use mean names and nicknames or, or just be really hard on your children. That's not any form of love. Um, and then we have uh, also their social needs. So the, so the next, you know, once their safety and security is met, then you need to make sure that they have obviously unconditional love from you, but also other, um, their peers and have interactions with people in their own peer group. They have plenty of play. We talked about young children, especially before the age of seven. They need play. You have to give them room to play and not shush them, quiet them, stop it every two seconds. That's not normal. If you have a noise issue, then just remove yourself. But and I'm t speaking for, as someone who, as I'm getting older, I'm noticing my sensitivity to noise more and more. But I've had to also do that for myself. And my husband, Marshall, he's the one who's like, no, just let them be. They're wrestling. They're you know they're they're loud. We have you know or it's a it's a home, but there's there's rooms that I could go to. But sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm already settled into my space. But I'll have to get up and go because I realize. They need that outlet. They need, you know, they need to play. So we have to, you know, watch ourselves as, as adults and realize these are needs that, that we have to meet for them. And then um, esteem, you know, making sure that we encourage them, that they are protected. If you, if you know if your children are in a school setting where they've reported to you that they are being bullied, and you're just like, oh, I, I had a conversation with a teacher, and that's it. No, it, you have to make sure it's shut down. It, because the child may not feel inclined to talk to you about it again because it's embarrassing, right? Like, if, and sometimes you'll just think, well, I don't hear anything. I guess that everything's fine. That's passive parenting. You can't just wait for your children to always tell you everything. There are usually signs to problems. You know, if they're not speaking very much, if they just seem a little more agitated, irritable, and their, their schoolwork, you know, is going down. Pay attention to, the, to your children. Sometimes parents, because we're so overburdened and all, you know, we're doing so much, it's like if there's no, if there isn't a fire right in front of me, I guess there's no problem, you know, I don't have to worry about it. But there could be embers, there could be sparks, you know, underneath, and they're just waiting to ignite. So how about being vigilant, and if you, you know, being in touch with the teachers, making sure that any type of bullying is absolutely eradicated from their life. So that you, you know, they don't have that pressure. If they keep complaining to you, they don't want to go to school. Like every other day, they're making excuses. I'm sick. I'm not feeling good. That's probably a sign something's going on. Find out who it is. Talk to those parents. If it's a, you know, if it's an Islamic school, um, obviously, you know, you have more opportunity. But even if it's in a public school, talk to the teachers. Talk to the administration. Be that nagging parent. Do it for your children's sake because we are in a crisis. We're in a time where children are, and it's happening even in our own community. This uh, topic of suicide is not something that we can say oh, it doesn't happen. No, nope, it happens, and it has happened. Stuff for a lot. And children have expressed these very horrible, um, you know, ideas to, to, to people because you know that that's where they're at. They they feel like they don't have any other recourse. So you have to be your child's advocate. This is a basic need: making sure that they're protected from bullies and that they have, um, you know, safe and, and good companions to be around, okay? Did I see a hand up? No? Okay. And then, um, and then uh, obviously self-actualization, this is what we all want for our children. We want them to be successful in every which way, but this can be encouraged through looking at what their interests are, hobbies, really trying to connect with your children to figure out what their interests are instead of just giving them a list of things that you think are better for them. If you're forcing your kids to take piano lessons and they tell you, I hate it, why? Just because you can go brag to your family, oh, they play the piano? It's crazy. If they have no desire to do piano, don't let them do the piano. If they have no desire to be, you know, doing anything, a sport, if they don't, if your boys are not athletic, it's okay because not every boy has to be an athlete. Okay, some boys are, are just not interested in running around all day and sweating. They would actually rather go and maybe, you know, learn something and produce something. They have, you know, more other, build something. So encourage that, nurture that, and don't hold them to these standards like, oh, this is, you know, how, this is the only successful 
uh, model of what it means to be a boy or a girl. Get out of that type of thinking and actually be in tune with your children. Listen to them. Ask them, what do you want to do? We have some extra money maybe to, for, for a budget for classes for you. Is there any particular subject that interests you? Is it art? Is it whatever, philosophy, I mean, I don't know, whatever their interest in poetry. It could be many different things, but find out from them, then look around. We have so many resources now, whether it's going to a place or actually online, but you can do that. And this is encouraging them, what? To become more defined people. Because they are defined, they're individuals, they're not just extensions of you and me. And I think that's the, the, the problem with a lot of parenting or parents is that they're stuck in this thought that children have to be little mini versions of them. No, they do not. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're responsible for them for a short period of time. Our charge, again, using the same model we used before, is to make sure that they're nurtured, that they're guided, and that they're protected. But their individual uh, facets that make them who they are are beautiful parts of who, you know, their individuality that we should nurture. We should, you know, and even if we don't agree with it or we don't like it, as long as it's not haram, obviously, and it's in line with our you know, beliefs and values, it shouldn't be a problem. So just understanding these things. And why is this important? Because characteristics of self-actualizers. So people who are self-actualized, and this applies for all of us as well as what we want, should want for our children. Okay? If you're a self-actualized person, obviously there's no such thing as a perfect person, but this would be, according to Maslow, the highest like, um, you know, you're, you're at your highest potential. If you are self-actualized, these are the qualities or characteristics that you will possess. So just, and I don't know if you can read it all. I'm sorry for the small font, but I wanted to put it all on one slide. So they perceive reality efficiently and can tolerate uncertainty. I mean, if this isn't what we should want for ourselves and for our children, right? Because uncertainty is part of life. Right? If, if something, God forbid, happens, but you're able to be okay, right? because you submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a huge benefit. There's people who resist things all the time, and they're very, you know, they can't handle things when it happens to them. Um, and they suffer for it. But if you're a self-actualized person, you understand qadha wa qadr, right? فَقَدَرَ اللَّهُ مَا شَفَعَلُ Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does as He wills, I have to accept, you, it, it, you, you become just, you know, sabam, I'll just be patient, inshallah. You understand there's wisdoms beyond our, our understanding in this world, but maybe inshallah one day, inshallah one day we will. We will. You know, one of the most beautiful, majestic places in God's creation, and this is you the whole time, you know? So no, you should look outside, experience what's happening, and take joy, let your eye take it in. And I know even now, I mean, I've, I've seen all these Facebook posts with, um, you know, the, the skyline, the San Francisco skyline, before and after the, sm the smoke. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah, again, something we take for granted, right? You can't go out, there's no clear sky. The skies are horrible to look at now. They're so, you know, muggy and just, they don't look beautiful. And then you, I, I honestly forgot. I forgot what it looks like to look out and to see a clear, beautiful sky and see blue and see clouds. I don't, I can't remember because it's been so long. It's been over a week now, we haven't seen that but to teach our children to appreciate these things. So even now with all this that's going on, teach your children, you know, look out, look at Allah's creation, SubhanAllah, we're in this really difficult time now. Make dua, inshallah, when the rain comes and hopefully in the next few days, things clear. Make them go outside and say, make sure go to Allah for a clear sign. Alhamdulillah, you know? That's really appreciating an experience, you know? Establishing deep, satisfying interpersonal relationships with a few people. You, none of us need a lot of friends, okay? You don't need a lot of friends. And if you think that's what makes you loved, that's crazy. It's not about quantity. It's about the quality of your friendships. Having a, de having a, a, a sister or a brother that you can rely on, that you can call on for your needs, for an emergency situations, or that you can entrust with an amana or with anything, that is... There's nothing like that, you know, there's no compare, the, the, having, you know, just even one of those is such a great benefit. And hold on to that. But teach your children the same, that when they're in school, they shouldn't be concerned with being the most popular person and having all these friends, because those friends are likely not going to last. You know, how many of us still maintain relationships with people we knew in high school? Very few. And if you do, maybe one or two. But those are the types of friendships they should maintain, right? Those, uh, those deep, real, serious committed friendships, but not to look at quantity. Um, peak experiences, 
need for privacy. So yeah, you're modesty, right? Haya, you're just a person who's not out and boasting about every single thing that you do and say and you're out there. Self-actualized people are confident. They don't need to, to, to do that, to, to be open with every single thing. So alhamdulillah, we should want this for ourselves and for our children. Democratic attitudes, obviously, balance, you know, in how we do things. And then strong moral and ethical standards. I mean, subhanAllah, like I said, these are all very prophetic qualities, but this is the benefit of what? This, for our children. Meeting them at their needs, making sure that we understand what their needs are, and working with them. And if there's an area that isn't, that they're stuck at, and that's why it's important to look at, you know, studies. Like, for example, children who, again, come from abusive or really toxic homes, they um, manifest Right? They don't do well in their uh, performance at school. It's just there's a correlation. Abuse, bullying, all these things have an effect on their potential. Do you get it? So if you have, you can't you know, expect them to thrive if you're not meeting the need for safety and security. So again, look at where your children are. Am I meeting their basic needs? If there's an area that I'm failing in, guess what? It's going to affect them. And as a parent, what's my job? It's to protect them, right? So now the behavior that leads to self-actualization -actual, is also important to understand. Because it's, you know, I just thought the wording here was really important, subhanAllah. But look at the first one, experiencing life like a child with full absorption and concentration. So this is again for us to really appreciate the mind of a child. The children, they learn with wonder and awe, right? And I think we talked about that possibly in maybe the first session, but if we've lost awe, uh, you know, and we've lost the ability to look at the world with that sense of wonder, then that should bother us a little bit, you know, because the world is a place full of wonder, and we should, you know, subhanAllah, you know, when we do dhikr, we do it like that. It's not just like, you know, we have our tasbih, and it's just, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But there should, I mean, that's, you know, if you're just trying to get to your goal, I get it. But there should be also times where you look for, uh, or just, you know, reflect, right? Muraqaba, what we talked about before. And you're reflect, reflecting on something, and then, subhanAllah, you know? Like, really deeply having that, like, amazement at, uh, at, at something. But that's how children are, even if they don't use those terms. They're always, like, wowed by things, aren't they? Oh, wow, 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 you know? And so it's beautiful, but if you want to be a self-actualized person, try to inculcate that sense of wonder and awe more in yourself and absorb things, you know. Uh, that's why mindfulness is important, being present, you know. If you're distracted, if you're if you're in a class, and alhamdulillah, I don't see you know anybody doing it here, but if you're in a class and and you're on your phone, you know, <laughs> that's not you're not there with full presence, right? You're not how much are you absorbing if you're like on Facebook and like snapping? And actually you see that now too with, with experiences. A lot of people and are 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 living so much through their lens, they're not actually there. And I'm almost always amazed. My son was playing this morning and he was, you know, he had this really creative game and I was trying to uh, videotape it because I was like, you know, this is so cute. It's a memory that I want to keep. I realize I don't have memories of him. And he just turned seven, so he's going to grow out of this play stage. It just dawned on me. I'm like, I don't have any memories of him playing. So I was trying to capture it. And he caught me within two, first, like, two seconds. You know, he looked at me. He knew I was videotaping. And then I thought about it. I said, Pala, how do these people do it? Like, you know, people who are very good at, like, you know, posting videos of, of every event in their life. Because they, they could be, they're, they're professional. I'm like, I don't know, was I like, too obvious? But I was like just realizing like a lot of people are very good at capturing moments without people being aware of it. But it's gotten to a point of like, are you actually in the moment yourself, you know? And if you're not, that's a that's a huge problem. So the need to constantly snap or, you know, uh, put everything on a video is something we should control because we're missing out, right? So being, trying to have, you know, presence there, right, with uh, concentration. <laughs> trying new things instead of sticking to safe paths. So kind of, you know, pushing yourself to try things, uh, you know, out if you're very, very comfortable and set in your ways. And it's like, no, I don't want to try it. I've never done it. I don't like it. That's really limiting yourself. And especially if you're, if it's, a fa it's something that could also, uh, you know, be for your family that you don't want to try, you don't want to do. Maybe you're traveling to a certain place or trying a new adventure or trying a new activity as a family. Be a little bit more flexible and open as a parent because you want to, again, 
open pathways. You never know learning that could happen by just experience, being a little bit more open about something, right? <laughs> Listening to your own feelings and evaluating experiences instead of voice of tradition, authority, or the majority. So this is, you know, a good thing to just being in tune with yourself. This is how I would read this. Because if you're just, you know, totally checked out and the only voice you hear is moms or dads or someone else's and that's all you ever think is, is how you were told to think and you don't really listen to yourself, then I think it's, it caught, it's just, you're not being true and authentic. Whereas if you're listening to yourself and you're connected to yourself, you know, you, you, um, you evaluate experiences and allow yourself to, to, to have your own perspectives, you know, instead of always just repeating whatever else you were always told or, or, or thought to think. Avoiding pretense, game playing, and being honest. So again, if you want to be someone who's self-actualized, please, enough with the, you know, pretenses. Just be a transparent, honest, upfront person. This is prophetic. He did not wear masks with people. He was the same. He was very consistent in how he engaged with all people who he met, whether it was his family, friends, strangers, dignitaries, royalty. It didn't matter. He was just himself. And that's who he was with other people. If you are super duper, you know, uh, one way with, with a certain group of people and then a different way with other group of people, that's a problem. You need to sit and talk with yourself about that. You know, why am I like that, right? Um, and then be prepared to be unpopular in your views if your views do not coincide with those of the majority. Having values and sticking to them despite what everybody else thinks and says is very important. As Muslims, we know that. We live in a time and place where, yeah, being people of, you know, uh, having faith and having values that don't always, you know, correlate with, every, with what everybody else is doing isn't always easy, but you gotta stick to your values. This is important to me, right? We fast during Ramadan and everybody else looks at us like we're crazy. Uh, we don't, um, you know, our kids don't drink or, uh, you know, go to, you know, clubs, inshallah, and do all this, other, you know, date and do all this other stuff. It's good for them to also have that same sort of backbone about it. Like, you know what, it's just against my video, uh, my principles, my values. I don't do those things, right? But not, you know, worrying about being popular. That's the issue, right? It's just to be like, you know what, people are not gonna always like that you don't do certain things. But it's okay, because they might not like it because you're, you know, for their own personal reasons but you at least can be proud that you stood up for yourself. You know, that's respectable in anybody's book, right? That you're that defined. And then trying to identify your defenses and having the courage to give them up. So if you are a self-actualized person, then maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're in touch with yourself and know, enough to know where you are defensive about what, and you know, to have a little bit more um, willingness Right to listen to critical feedback, to not be so defensive about everything, um, because your humility, right? Humility is a big part of this. If you're humble enough to accept that you don't know everything, then inshallah, you are able to take people's feedback, at whatever that may be. All right, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, we're going to resume um, from our break for Asim. So. Um, we're just talking about, again, behavior that leads to self-actualization and just looking first at ourselves because we want to be self-actualized people and then looking how we can encourage our children to, to be the same. Um, now, one of the things, because I want to, you know, we're about to end, so before we, uh, or when you leave home, I wanted to kind of give you something to do. So we came up with this, um, concept actually that I read from another author. Her name is Mimi Do, and she holds a master's degree in education from Harvard University, um, and herself is obviously a mother, but she's uh, appeared on Oprah, she's written for a lot of different publications, and she's written specifically on spiritual parenting. And so she came up with this idea of having your children do their own code of honor. Okay, so I really like this idea. And so, you know, just sitting with your kids, and first of all, I mean, as they're younger, you know, as we talked about in our very first session, the stories that we tell our children, um, whether it's from the theater or otherwise, you know, they should be appropriate, age-appropriate stories at, at different levels, but virtues that we want to constant, themes that should always come up 
are stories that have to do with virtues that we want them to eventually, inshallah, possess, like honor, nobility, right? Chivalry, uh, appreciating silence, you know, that, that, that there is virtue in that, you know? Um, gratitude, fortitude, modesty, all of these things that are prophetic qualities, but that they should re recognize how to recognize and they should be able to know. And then, um, so if we're doing that as they're, you know, in their younger years, that by the time they reach the age of, of understanding, a little, you know, whether it's junior high or high school, that age of uh, more mature sort of thinking, that they can start self-regulating, right? Um, and looking at themselves and their own behavior. So how do you do that? You encourage them, like, what do you, you know, what's your own code of honor, right? So encouraging your children to do that, you know, how do you um, want to behave or what do you think are, are virtues that you, uh, you know, engage with other people in? Or is there a certain way that you conduct yourself um, based on what? And, you know, describe that for us, like, I will not do this, you know, sort of like my own set of rules that they live by. Um, that they, you know, hold themselves accountable to, whether it has to do with themselves, their treatment of other people, their possessions, their material, you know, whatever it is, um, what they hold value. And let that be an exercise to reveal first, the first time you do it, it'll obviously give you as a parent something, you know, to see where your children are at. What are their, what values do they hold as dear and important? And then see if there's areas that you need to work with on them, or they might surprise you and you might be like, wow, Mashallah, you know, you, you've been listening all this time, you know, and then that becomes something that they hold themselves to account because it's very different than us always telling them what to do, you know, which they're very used to it when they're young, but by the time they reach the teenage years, we have to respect them more. They need to feel respected, and so this is now like, I want to see what you produce, you know, you tell me what is your, you know, uh, code of honor. Where are your? What are you? What's? What do you value? And let them do that, inshallah. And then you know, let that be another exercise. You know, that uh, a family sort of group activity that really, again, brings the family together, brings more mutual respect and understanding to one another. These are the types of things that we should be aiming for, at, on in everything that we talked about. Is is it going to promote love, understanding, respect? I'm going to do that, whatever that is, mutual. It can't be just top down, okay? And I think a lot of parenting model is like, you just, you know, you're the parent, you're the authority figure, and you're just always telling your children what to do at all times, and that's what parenting is. But, you know, that, you know, when they're younger and they don't understand, that's, you know, to a certain degree, okay. But as they grow older, you have to see their growth and appreciate them for being individuals and being, think, you know, like they're independent thinkers. And also test your own parenting. Ch check in. See if they're learning things that you've taught them. If they're not, it's going to become apparent when you give them an exercise like this, right? So just something to do, inshallah. And then um, this is just a quote that she also had in her book that I really liked. Um, and we'll end it on this. Accept your child as a beautiful and miraculous gift, alone from God. See the best in him, for he will then see the best in himself or herself. Praise and encourage his or her positive qualities. Feed his spirit by making sure he knows that you love him, flaws and all. He is worthy just as he is. How you see your child expands into how he sees himself. Okay, so if you have a lot of just positive love, admiration, respect for your child, they will see that in themselves. But if you're hypercritical, negative, nothing's ever good enough, and you're just not understanding of who they are, you know, dismissive when they express an opinion, <laughs> oh, whatever, you don't know, you, oh, you youth, you know, and you're just kind of like always dismissing them for not knowing or not being smart or not being, you know, whatever, this is how then they'll, they might reflect themselves eventually. So you really, we really do have a lot of power in that regard. And so just know, and that's why it's so important to see parenting as an amana, right? Because we're gonna be held accountable for
for how we use that power. You know, are we um, aware of the impact of our words and our actions toward these children that Allah has entrusted us with, or do we just take them for granted as little, you know, minions and extensions of ourselves that are just there to serve us? Where are you in that? You know, how do you see your children? So, inshallah, on that note, we'll go ahead and end. Are there um, any questions from any of you or any comments? Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Well, thank you for attending, inshallah. The video will be up soon. Um, if you missed any part of it or if you would like to share it, and then, you know, we'll, we'll resume, inshallah, next month for the fourth session. Okay, jazakallah. And we'll end on the dua. Thank you so much.